Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first day in the life event for the spring semester. And I want to just give you a little bit of background for those of you who are not familiar with the series. We started this series with the launch of the master's program back in 2016, so it's been going strong ever since. We've had wonderful speakers. We invite two speakers every semester to talk to students about a day in the life of their career. Um, it gives students an opportunity, we hope, to see what the paths are, the educational paths and career paths, um, to get people where they are, what their day looks like, and then how their work fits in with that broader area of psychology in which they reside. So we started originally focusing just on developmental psychology and IO psychology, focusing on the areas that aligned with the master's program. But since then, we've added on other areas that align with the undergrad program and just tons of different subfields in psychology in general. Um, so the students can see a wide variety of career options available to them when they graduate, whether it's with a bachelor's degree or a master's degree, or in some cases, a PhD. So today, I'm very excited. We have Dr. Nasheen Pasha Zaidi, who's going to be speaking. Um, some of you have taken classes, um, have had uh, Dr. Pasha Zaidi as your instructor, and some of you haven't. Um, those of you who haven't are in for a treat today. You're going to get to hear about some of the awesome work that she's doing and has done in the past. And we were just talking before this, and I was saying that I, I feel like this is such a unique opportunity for students to see what a nonlinear path looks like because sometimes students think that you just go to school in these directions and you just fall into your area or you choose your one area. And I think um, Dr. Pasha Zaidi's um, path has been nonlinear, um, which is awesome. And also, I think the amazing thing about her work is that it touches on multiple areas of psychology. So some people just reside in kind of one area. And um, Dr. Pasha Zaidi's work really is sort of across of multiple areas. And so I think it gives you a unique perspective into how you can take all these different areas and facets of your interests and um, sort of dip into different areas of, of psych um, to come up with something that's really unique um, like Dr. Pasha, Pasha Zaidi's work. So I'm gonna read um, Dr. Pasha Zaidi's bio so you can learn a little bit more about her. Um, she has worked with international and marginalized populations for over 20 years. She has degrees in communication, education, psychology, and has co-edited three books addressing international Muslim populations. Her, her latest edited book, um, Look individuals and communities through a strength. Dr. Pasha's articles have appeared in numerous peer-reviewed journals, including Ethnicity Learning and Psychology Learning and Teaching. She also presented her research at several international conferences. Um, the International Institute of Knowledge Management um, is one of them, the uh, Sixth World Conference on Women's Studies, and the National Women's Studies Association Conference are among many. Dr. Pasha is an avid supporter of student research and community-based participatory approaches. And she is currently, on top of already having lots of degrees, um, is currently working on an EDD in higher education leadership, diversity and equity at the University of Illinois Urban uh, Champaign. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over um, to Dr. Pasha and she can uh, fill you in on her work a little bit further. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Marquez. That was a really nice intro. I hope I can live up to it. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. For those of you that have had me, um, you can probably hear how difficult it is to say my name. <laughs> and, and so as a result, I really just go by Dr. N in all of my classes. And um, I think so far that's that's worked for me. <laughs> And so uh, if you if you would like to ask anything, you don't have to use my whole name by by any means, just um, Dr. N is fine, mainly because I don't like Dr. P. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about a day in my life, which, um, as Dr. Marquez pointed out, has been extremely nonlinear. And I guess it just goes to show you that if you love a topic, a subject, and it keeps calling you, then you're going to have to follow through on it in some way or another. Otherwise, it's just going to keep bothering you. And you'll see that uh, in just a little bit. So go ahead and move myself over. 
All right. So these, I, I guess when I, when I was asked to do this, I had to kind of decide which area of psychology I felt most comfortable belonging to. And I, and I realized that, you know, because my background, which you'll see in a little bit is very interdisciplinary. It's hard for me to say, I am an IO psychologist. I am a um, well, I'm definitely not a clinical psychologist, but I am, you know, social psychologist. I'm an educational psychologist. And so really uh, what I did was put those three main areas that I tend to work with under the umbrella of cultural psychology, because that's the one that really seems to blend all of them. When I look at organizations, I look at international companies, international um modes of, of, of being and, and communication. And um, same thing with social psychology, especially groups, uh, in-group, out-group. I've done some work with that. And educational psychology, which one of my degrees is in. And that's actually been the area that has kind of propelled me through my life is the discipline of education. And so really the way that those three blend is through the lens of culture and religion to some extent. But um, I'm, even though I've kind of focused on Muslim populations in my research, I'm interested in larger um, kind of ideas of culture uh, uh, across any cultural group really. So I'm, I'm very much open to that. And I, and I love listening to uh, to the wonderful ways in which human beings are diverse. I really do believe in the um, in the idea of diversity, equity, social justice, inclusion. Um, that's really very, very important and special to me. And that's one of the reasons I went back and am trying to do another degree. Anyway, we'll talk about that in a bit. So this is kind of where I, what I just said. So who am I? Okay, well, I'm a lot of things. And again, I had to really kind of think about where where I fit in, uh, we're as psychologists, as human beings, we're, we're really all about labeling and categorizing. It helps, you know, it helps the brain understand information and and synthesize information so that we're not overwhelmed. And so for me to try to find these categories, it was a little difficult, but I was like, well, you know, what's the very first thing? And the very first thing for me has always been education. I've been an educator. Um, I started off in the K-12 uh, in New Jersey, I moved several states. Uh, and so I've been certified in several states. I, I taught e ESOL, it depends on where you are. It could be ELL, ESL, ESOL, they, they call them different things. Uh, basically English language learners uh, because my first love was, was culture, always has been. Um, and so I, I was a certified teacher and that was where I began my journey. And that was back in the nineties. <laughs> I don't know if any of you were even born then. You were probably very little, some of you. But um, that's when I started my journey. And um, and I did that in New Jersey. And then we moved. And um, I moved quite a, quite a bit. And you'll see uh, in some of the pictures that I that that I share later, some of the places that um, I've had the had the privilege of of living in and visiting. But uh, across the United States, I moved to um, to Arizona. I worked in Arizona as a certified teacher and a lot of it in virtual education. Uh, I lived in Virginia and I worked for the Fairfax County Public Schools, again, as an ESL, ESOL teacher is what they called it there. I lived in uh, Hillsborough County in Florida and doing the same thing. And so I got a lot of uh, feedback on the ways in which education, at least K-12 education, which is what I did for the first 10 years of my uh, of my career, really kind of works in the United States and to some some degree overseas. So since uh, since 2011, I'd say, uh, so maybe like 10, 11, 12 years ago, um, I started also working on research and um, I started, it, well, this was this my second attempt at a PhD, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but when I started going into research, I just realized, oh my God, I love this. I love research, and um, I love you know the lit, the lit review portion, which you know takes the longest, just finding information, synthesizing information, finding out what's already available to answer a research question, and um, and you know developing your own questions, and then you know kind of figuring out the best research design. And a lot of the ones that I've become more fond of are the participatory designs, where you're not just a researcher; you're always going to be kind of here a little bit, 
a little bit uh, disconnected from your participants. But I like the idea of participatory research, um, which it has its basis in indigenous psychology, because it allows the participants to have a an important, a meaningful role in the research where they where they have conversations with the researcher about what it is that their communities need to find out, what kind of research do they need information for, so that there's a bit of a conversation in that. So as a researcher, I've done, um, uh, I've edited a few books. Um, I've got, you know, like journal articles, book chapters and things, and, um, you know, several conferences. I just got back actually from the, uh, the Society of Social and Personality uh, conference SPSP, which was in Atlanta. So I just got back from that on on Saturday, Sunday, can't remember. So just this weekend. And uh, and that was really that was really fun. Um, I like going to conferences. They they allow you to talk to people who are also interested in the same discipline and the same ideas. Um, and you can talk to a lot of a lot of different people. And I I tended to meet uh, people that I look up to and who I have cited, which is Oh my God, the most awesome thing is to meet someone who you have cited and you're like, oh, you are so and so. It's so nice to meet you. It's amazing. It's like um, it's like meeting, I you know, Pedro Pascal right now, I guess, um, who I would like to meet too. But um He's not a researcher. So uh, most recently, I've, uh, I've also been uh, working in administration. Um, I did that a little bit earlier on where I was working in uh, professional development of teaching. And more recently, I've been uh, doing administration work, uh, committee work, some hiring, uh, mentoring. A PD means a professional development, um, basically faculty professional development, a lot of it having to do with adjuncts, which are part-timers. Uh, and I also do a lot, a lot, a lot of student uh, mentorship and advocacy. See, um, I am currently the director of one of the honors colleges at Houston Community College Southwest, and I also serve as a dissertation chair at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. That's where I got my PhD. So I tend to be in a lot of different places, and so you can kind of see that I keep myself busy by by enjoying diversity. And so when I talk about diversity, I really do live it within my own personal life as well. So as Dr. Marquez pointed out earlier, my career path has not been straight by any means. I loved psychology from the very beginning when I started my um, my undergraduate work, but I didn't wanna do a PhD. Who wants to be in school that long? No, no, no. I wasn't going to do a PhD. I was just going to do, you know, I was just going to get my bachelor's, go to work and, you know, get married, have a couple of kids, you know, that, that, that was it. And then have parties or something. I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't sure what I was thinking. I, uh, I graduated early, which, um, you know, which doesn't bode much now that we know that, um, now that I know rather that the brain doesn't uh, fully develop your, your prefrontal cortex and your frontal lobe is not really fully developed until you're in your mid twenties. So that doesn't help that I graduated with my undergrad degree at 21 and had absolutely no idea what I was doing. Uh, I knew I loved culture. I knew I loved travel. And so I worked for the airlines, um, making absolutely no money, three thirty-five an hour. You can go look that up. That was the minimum wage in New York where, where I was, uh, where I grew up. And, um, and I did that for several years until my mom was basically like, okay, this can't be the end for you. You need to you need to go and figure something else out. You need to, you know, you need to continue um, doing things with yourself. And so that was really the beginning of taking that lifelong learning journey, which was also supported later by my husband, who also said, well, you got to do a little bit more than this, you know, and so they were always um, encouraging me to, to continue to find new pathways. And so I did a lot of stuff. I went back to school. I worked on my master's. I did my master's in language education, um, TESOL, and that did wonders for me in terms of the first 10, 12 years of my life, even, even longer possibly, because that's where I became certified as a teacher, and that's how I got to do most of my traveling overseas, um, and so I did, I did studying, then I was working, um, then I, then, you know, I was like, okay, well, my husband was saying, well, you know, maybe you should think about, you know, doing a PhD or something or, or a doctorate because, um, you know, you're really good at that kind of stuff. I don't know how he thought that. But anyway, so I said, well, the only thing I would ever get a doctorate in is psychology. That's the only thing. And so that was the beginning of the um, of my career path in in that sense, because I went to um, to a university in Arizona 
and I began working on a PhD in educational psychology. Unfortunately, when I got to the dissertation stage, I went through all of the courses, flew by them. That was great. Still didn't know what exactly I was wanted to focus on. Um, I knew I had wanted to stay in education because I've been working in education and I knew I love psychology, but I knew nothing about research. Absolutely nothing. And um, and so I kind of floundered about and then we moved. And as a result, I floundered about a little bit more. I took some more classes here and there. I was in Oklahoma, I think at the time, took some classes at the University of Tulsa, still had no idea. And so um, studying and then I got another job and I thought, well, that's it. You know, I'm just going to I'm just going to take a master's. This is not going anywhere. I'm just going to take a second master's. And, uh, you know, that actually was very helpful later because when uh, when I started working overseas and doing professional development for, for teachers overseas, I used all of that information that I learned in my ed psych because that was, you know, that's how you do teacher training is you really take um, pedagogy and uh, look at it from a psychological lens, how, how you know, how human beings teach and learn and, and, and build curriculum and things. So studying, working, and then um, I was just basically doing one at a time, which is, I think, what some, some normal people do. But um, I think most of us are not normal. And so uh, I, was, uh, I was working overseas, and um, my friend who had been at the same university in Arizona, and uh, where I had originally been trying to get my PhD, she got her PhD. Now, mind you, this is five years later. And, um, and so I was like, wait a minute, what do you mean? You got your PhD, but I, I just, all I have, I just got a master's which is nothing wrong with that. That's great. Cause that's what got me as far as I had been, but I thought, no, 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 no. If, if you can do it, I, I can do this. And so I went back to school, um, and, um, and I started working and studying and doing both things together. And that seems to be the, um, the key to where, where I have, um, gone in my career path. So as you can tell, it's kind of been windy. It's been a windy road. So if you're in a position where you have changed your field or you're not quite sure where you are now or where you're going tomorrow, it's okay. There, I mean, there, you, you will find your way. You will find your way. If there's something in your gut, that's really calling you and saying, you have to, you have to follow through on me. I won't go away. I won't leave you alone. You know, think about that um, and look for career opportunities that meld your experiences and um, and where you want to go. It's um, it's not always going to be a clear path. Um, so, yes, along the ways, I did spend seven years overseas uh, because, you know, I wanted to be overseas. I had grown up in New York. Uh, I had lived in several states, as I mentioned already, and uh I, I wanted to go overseas. I had always wanted to do that. I wanted to do the Peace Corps or something. I just wanted to live in, in a cultural environment that was not something I was familiar with. And, you know, I was an immigrant. I am an immigrant. Um, I'm what you would consider 1.5 generation. Um, I was born in Pakistan, but I moved here with my family when I was five years old. So my first schooling, my kindergarten was in New York. I was an ELL student. Um, I was very shy. And um, I remember people pushing me a lot. I'm not very nice, whoever you were. I don't remember you anymore, <laughs> thankfully. But, um, you know, so I, I've had a lot of those experiences on the other side as well. So I really wanted to really experience that idea of culture shock and, 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 and you know, having, having a, a whole different worldview. And let me tell you, that sounds much more romantic when you say it than when you live it. <laughs> it's very, it's not easy when you're actually living it um, because I absolutely did um, have a culture shock. I moved to Dubai. I was in the Middle East uh, for, for like I said, seven years, 7.5, something like that. I came back and forth a couple of times, uh, well, once. And so it's a little bit choppy again, but you know, you can see my path is kind of windy anyway. Um, so it fits within my path. Um, but when I was there, when I first went there, I said, I just want to go home to Arizona. I would wake up in, in my hotel room, um, because it took about six weeks before they were able to place me in a, in a, you know, in an actual location where we could live. Um, the one good, one great thing about, uh, working in Dubai and the UAE was that when you, when you go there, um, if you, if you're teaching, which is what I was doing, I was doing teacher training. That's when I met by doing professional development overseas. That's when I first, uh, moved there was to work with 
ELL teachers and um, and work with uh, pedagogical techniques and things, kind of trying to meld what they did in the Arab world with um, some of the creative um, teaching skills that were taught again in my both my in both of my master's programs, to be honest with you. And so when I got there, I was just so confused because nothing made sense. And so you know, being being an immigrant, I didn't remember that because I was only five. And I sort of remembered, you know, like I said, I remember people pushing me and being and being bullied, but um, but I didn't remember all of that ex that experience that you go through when you have a completely different area around you. You have completely different norms and nothing feels normal at all. So the word normal really took on a whole new meaning for me uh, when I, when I, you know, when I learned what normal was not, which is being American um, in, in the UAE. And, um, and so I have a lot of respect. I have a lot of respect for, for the students who have come here as adults and have you know started a new life in the United States from wherever wherever they were or even even students who go from one state to another state um, or even take on any new challenges because all of those have a level of culture shock you have to learn new norms whether that's a new job in an organization or whether that's a new country altogether and it's all about finding your way and and making mistakes unfortunately but being open to to learning from those mistakes and being humble and having humility and that's one of the things that I really really learned in the UAE because I was not a citizen and um you know I was a visitor I was on a contract to do work and um you know and the the lifestyle you know you get used to the lifestyle um but at, at the beginning, it was very, very difficult when, you know, when, when we think about the cable guy, let me give you this, when you can't, when you think about the cable guy coming, right, and he, they say, oh, you know, well, well, do they, we have cable guys anymore? No, I guess we have internet people. Okay, the internet is down. So, um, you know, you're waiting for the internet to, to come back up and they say anytime between, you know, 9 a.m. and 4 p.m., you know, we'll get, we'll get it working again. And you're like, oh. What is this? This is craziness. What am I gonna do without my internet? I gotta use my hotspot. I gotta go to Starbucks or whatever. You gotta make um, you gotta make accommodations for that. But you know, usually they're pretty good. They'll get it done within within the time slot that they've told you. Well, uh, not all cultures work like that. So um, in in a lot of cultures where there isn't that direct speech happening, uh, you'll you'll find that people say, um, "Oh, okay, I'll call you right back," which means that they'll never call you again. <laughs> And they will not pick up your phone if they see your number um, or uh, or something else along those lines. Or they will say, oh, yes, I'm coming Tuesday at 10 a.m. And you, you know, take the day off from work and you're sitting there waiting Tuesday, 10 a.m. comes, 11 a.m. comes, 12 p.m. It's like 7 p.m. at night. Oh, tomorrow. And um, in Arabic, that was Bukra, Bukra, inshallah. That was uh, that basically said, we'll think about it. It means tomorrow, uh, God willing. Uh, but it was interesting to learn all of these things because so many times I waited for these people to call me back and nobody called me back. And it took me a while to understand, no, they just don't tell you directly. It's just not the way that the communication happens in a lot of non-Western cultures. Um, so that took me that took me a while to really realize how American I had become over the course of my life. So anyway, this is these are some of the degrees that I have. I kind of mentioned them along the way. I have a bachelor's in speech communications. Uh, I to really show you how how nonlinear my path has been. I went to Pace University in New York, and I um I started at well I was admitted. I got in as an accounting major. And I took accounting in high school and I was like, I can't spend my life doing this. So I went in and um, again, you know, I loved psychology, but I was the only thing I knew about psychology is that you have to have a PhD and it's only clinical and da, 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 da. I didn't know anything. And so um, I was like, no, I can't do that. I don't want to be in, in school forever. Okay. I know that's ironic. So, um, but then, so I thought, okay, well, what, what else do I love? Well, I love media, so I'll do speech communication. So when I was there to register, I just changed my major and did speech communications. I had no idea what I was going to do with it, um, but I loved media. And so I did enjoy that program a lot. And it did help me really kind of learn to get out of that, that shyness that, that I had um, 
and focus on trying to be a little bit more clear, um, speaking extemporaneously, which I still try to do. Uh, and then of course I told you I went to my master's program um, and that's when I did my language uh, ed and that was at Rutgers. And cause I had moved to, uh, to New Jersey at that time. And then again, I moved and moved and moved. And so um, my next one, that was the PhD I was starting at, that was at Arizona State University and which I didn't finish. And then again, move, move, moved. And um, along the way, I, when I was looking for my PhD, I thought, well, what, what PhD do I want to do? You know, um, what would fit with my life now? Because I had been overseas already and, uh, and I wanted to be able to kind of explore both of those things. And so a new program had, had just start been started. Um, it was a, uh, it was what you would call a blended program um and which was you know very new at the time because it was you know back in 2010 2009 and that was um international organizations and systems so i thought oh wow that that's not possible that's exactly what i want to do and so i did that and um it was really, really good because first of all, I ended up going back overseas and because it was blended, I was able to continue it. Plus I got a chance to do two field experiences in two different countries, one in the, um, one in New Zealand with the Maori tribe, amazing, amazing spiritual journey there. And one in South Africa, learning about uh, race and the continuing impact of race and racism within, within the school systems there. So uh, that was what I had done back until 2012. And that's when I started working on a lot of my research and my books. And mostly just recently, because I'm back in the United States, I really wanted to be able to you know, focus more clearly on what the issues of diversity and equity are here in the U.S. And so I guess I'm in my second year of the EDD program. So I'm going slowly uh, because I'm really just enjoying it. Um, I'm not doing this for the letters uh, because you can see my name already has a lot of letters. And so it's just going to be more complicated by adding more letters. But it's okay. It'd be good. It's going to be good. The more letters you can put on, if it makes you happy, you go do that. Okay. Um, and you know, and, and really, I'm, I, I guess, because I'm working in administration now, I wanted to be able to have a little bit more experience on what that is to be a leader in education. So that's been that. These are some of the pictures of when I lived in the UAE. And um, this is the Burj Khalifa, which you might have seen if you watched, uh, I don't know, Mission Impossible. <laughs> and um, and actually, he, he was there, um, was it? Tom Cruise, he was there while, um, I didn't meet him, but some of my students did. And um, he, uh, he did actually go to the top of the Burj Khalifa. You can see this is not done. So I was there in Dubai when this was not completed. Um, and so when I, I left Dubai and I came back and it was completed by then, but it is an amazing, amazing building. And in the lower corner, you can see what the view looks like from the top. And you can see that it's very diverse. You have the you have the mosques, that's the Sheikh Zayed Mosque in, um, in Abu Dhabi, but you have these wonderful highways. Oh my God, I came back and I was like, oh my God, these, these roads are not good. These roads are not good because the highways are in the roads, uh, well, just the highways, not so much the roads, the highways are absolutely wonderful in the UAE. Um, but they also have these dows, these boats that will take you across the creek. And uh, and then you have these malls. Can, I don't know if you can see, but that's a Payless store in, um, I think it was in Dubai Mall. So you can see the Arabic version of that. Um, and then they have the Emirates, Mall of the Emirates, which has Ski Dubai, which is indoor ski um, ski area. I can't ski. My husband did go on it. I cannot ski at all. So um, in order to preserve my life, I did not go in there. But those are my, those are my niece and nephew that did that. Um, okay, so I have a great question in here, which says, how were you able to contain your emotions when reading and research, and how do you maintain objectivity? Okay, so that is a great, great question. I'm going to hold on to that for just a bit, because I want to show you some of the things that I've done and how, and how I've actually tried to maneuver my own objectivity and my own positionality. So I'm going to get back to that. It's a great question, Lee. So I'm glad you brought that up. So I'm going to get back to that in just a few minutes. Just want to show you a couple more pictures. Um, these were some of the places that, um, as you can see, I took my family with me. Uh, and so they were able to live overseas. Uh, this is my son when he was, I don't know, like 
10 or something. Um, and that's Stonehenge in the back. And um, that's my brother. We did, we met him at um, in Cairo and he's an absolutely wonderful historian. He knows everything about everything. And so he was our tour guide during the uh, going through the Great Pyramids of Giza. And um, and that's my other son that's in Luxor. He was in Banana Island. Um, these are, they, they are not like this anymore by any means. My sons are 25 and 23-ish. And so this was obviously a long time ago. We also went to several places in Africa. This is with the Maasai uh, warriors in Kenya. Um, I can't remember if the swimming pool was in for monkeys was in Malaysia or Indonesia, but anyway, it's it's one of those. And then you can see this maximum security prison that was actually Robben Island um, on in South Africa, where I went for uh, my PhD. And um, and this is from Pakistan when you know when we went to visit Pakistan because that's only a, a few few hours flight and there's Cambodia and I believe that's in I believe that's Indonesia no Malaysia this is Malaysia on the side uh about two caves on the side with the with the big tall gold um statue there so just some of the places that I was very very lucky to be able to see and it was mainly because I lived overseas I gave myself that opportunity when but I but I didn't get it very easily just so you know it didn't like fall in my lap nothing I've ever done has fallen in my lap I've worked really really hard I'll show you what a day in my life looks like and you'll get an idea um that nothing has come easy I've um, I've got a lot of rejections from any from everywhere from journal articles that's easy getting rejections jobs easy getting rejections um, and so you learn to you learn to learn from that and kind of say well maybe that's not the path I would love that to be a path but that's not the path but and so I had I followed a different path for example had I done my my PhD at Arizona State none of these pictures that you see here would have ever happened because I probably would not have had the opportunity to go overseas. So, you know, if things come your way that are not in the plan that you have, it's hard. I'm not going to say it's not hard, but just try to be open to it. Try to see what you can do with it. And sometimes you just have to walk through it and you just have to learn from it. And you won't see that until you get through that tunnel of whatever it is that you're going through, whatever challenges you're going through. So my typical day, I'm going to kind of wrap this up here um, and just show you one more slide and then I'm going to. Uh, start with Lee's question. So my typical day, I do, a, I work at several different places. And so it's a combination. It can be a combination of any of these things. My full-time position is at Houston Community College. So I teach courses in psychology, um, education, and humanities. I'm taking my um, honors college students to Mexico uh, over spring break. So we're, we're learning a lot about Mexico and that's a humanities course. I do academic advising. A lot of it is on group me or phone. I mean, I literally had to take care of something nine o'clock last night. It's just, it's always on because I would want that from someone. So I try to do what I can for my students as well. Um, Grading, as you can see, I do grading, lots and lots and lots of grading, and that's pretty much every day. Some sort of grading is happening every day. Um, at the Chicago School, I'm providing feedback on the dissertation chapters. I have biweekly meetings with my students. Um, at CUNY here, which I love CUNY, by the way. Oh my God, you are so lucky to be here. I love CUNY. Um, I teach courses in psychology, and I'm open to all sorts of different ones. I've been teaching uh, social psychology, different IO psychology courses. I'm also part of the what's called the consortial faculty, and I do work with course reviews and, and um, observations of courses and, uh, and some student admissions work. And then, of course, I'm at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, and there I get to study and I get to listen to other people tell me about um, theories and how theories fit within uh, within the education environment. I'm still doing research. I'm working with uh, a professor at uh, at. UIUC um, who's working who does work on belongingness and first generation students and so we just submitted um, a journal article there for publication so I'm still doing all of that um, and here a little bit differently for me is that I'm getting graded so for me grading and being graded seems to be the common theme in my typical day. So these are some of the contributions that I've made to Muslim psychology since most of my work with the books that I've done has been on Muslim psychology, which I think kind of leads to the question, how do I remain object objective? Well, first of all, it's hard to not to get emotional. So, you know, as human beings, that's 
one thing that we need to always be cognizant of. And as researchers, I know that we are, especially when you're doing quantitative, which my dissertation was quantitative, a lot of what I do is quantitative research, you have to really kind of take yourself out of it so that you can look at the um, at your data with objectivity. A lot of that has to do with what is already available in the literature, what is known from previous studies. And that helps you kind of frame the way that you can be looking. So it's not just coming from you and your own anecdotal experiences, although those certainly with when you're talking qualitative uh, you know, work, which the mirror on the veil is a is a qualitative. It's actually what you would consider raw data, but edited raw data on uh, uh, personal um, essays that were done about hijab and veiling. And, um, and so that's where really I started working on participatory approaches. And for that, you really need to maintain your emotions in the sense that you need to be able to uh, find your positionality and also bracket that and say, okay, this is what I feel. This is where, you know, this is the part that that I am, you know, having difficulty with um, and really kind of focusing on the information you're getting and then just always being cognizant of where you are. And that's that metacognitive stuff. It's, it's always ongoing in research because you always have to remember, even with quantitative, because you get your um, you get your data analysis, right? Everything has to be operationalized. What do you mean by attitudes? What do you mean by behaviors? Everything has to be operationalized. So when I talk about positive psychology, which as you can see, I've done a lot in positive psychology, we talk about things like happiness. What does that mean? There are different ways of operationalizing that. And so when you talk about research and happiness, and the, the first thing I do is, I look at who was asked those questions, who are your participants, and what did they use to define those constructs? Because perhaps I'm looking at it from a different way. And so when you start putting all of that information together, it helps you kind of not necessarily be completely objective because we can't be. I mean, we all know about, as psychologists, we know about implicit bias. And so I think we should be uh, ready to acknowledge that, that there are things that we may not recognize. But hopefully, when you are working with other researchers, which, you know, if you decide to do research, you will be working with other researchers, you will be able to have people who can talk you through it and provide you different perspectives. That's the reason diversity of experience is so important in a research team, because something that you may think is just a weird phenomenon, whether it's just, you know, coming out of the, the numbers that you get in your quantitative analysis, you're like, okay, that's just weird. Somebody else on your team might say, oh, well, that makes sense in this cultural context and such and such and such. And so um, I've had, I've been that to other people and other people have been that for me. And I, I, and I think that's the, that's one of the ways that I really try to maintain professionalism and objectivity as much as you can within social science. I hope I hope that was helpful, Lee. So I'm gonna stop there. I took way too much time, but I hope that was helpful and I open to questions. Yeah, no, not too much time at all. This has been great. Um, other questions for Dr. N. Um, so someone, uh, Mauricio says, as someone who has completed and floundered with academic writing, for your degrees throughout your career, what helped you complete all the writing that was required of you? Okay, great, Mauricio. Um, and I'm glad actually to see you here. I know I'm, I'm on your committee. So um, uh, it's it's really just practice, to be honest with you. The more you the more you work on it, uh, when, when I started writing, I did not know what research was. And that was one of the reasons I did not finish that degree at Arizona State because I just did not know what that writing meant or what what it meant to do a lit review or how that you know translated into your own research. So once you get that, you have to remember this is your your project. You are going to be the expert on this for that time that you are writing, and so you have to put it into terms that you understand. So first of all, you know don't take too many quotes because if you're taking a lot of quotes, then you're just I don't know as a reader. Um, what is it from that quote that made sense to you? What did you get out of that quote? So, you know, use quotes sparingly and for things that you really think, oh my gosh, this is just the perfect way of saying it. And then, then reword that so that, you know, as in, as you're writing it, you can say, this is what this means and how it applies in my, in my dissertation. So the more you write, 
you're really going to find yourself getting into a flow. Now, that means that you have to give yourself the opportunity to get in that flow. And sometimes it's not the right time to do it. But sometimes you just have to push yourself to say, okay, I don't want to do this. I'm scared of this or whatever is stopping a person from moving forward. And you say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to give myself 15 minutes. And if that's all I can do, if it's 15 minutes, I will just do that. And give yourself, make yourself that promise. And most of the time, you'll find that in those 15 minutes, 20, you will get yourself involved in your writing so that you will find that sense of flow. And it doesn't have to be perfect. The first time you write something, just get it down on paper. And then you will have many, many times to revise it. And the revisions are really the most important part of writing. It's not the first time you write anything. First time you just get it down to under, so that you have something on the paper that you can use. And then, and then you're going to get uh, feedback from your uh, committee chair. You're going to get feedback from your readers. You're, and that's when you're going to start making those changes. Uh, you're going to be re reading more and you're going to say, oh, this makes sense. And with, with this, so you really have to kind of put push yourself to be in that space. And then once you're there, just kind of let yourself go. Just go in and write it down. And then once it's written, then you work on fixing it up and making it as academic as you can. But first, get it, get something down on paper. If that helps. I hope that helps. Oh, I think you're 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 muted. You think after all this time uh, I, of doing Zoom meetings over this uh, three years of COVID, um, thank you for that. Other questions? And those are great tips, by the way, Dr. Ann, about uh, writing. I, I, I actually love writing. And, um, you know, with the whole thing about ChatGPT, I, and I looked at ChatGPT and um, I write like ChatGPT. <laughs> Yeah. So I don't know if that's good for chat GPT or me. One of us is a robot. <laughs> I was, uh, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar with chat GPT, if you haven't been seeing it, it's uh, this new, you know, AI sort of writing papers and, and the, you know, how kind of upset everyone is about the potential of this, but, um, uh, but it's, it's actually, I, I guess from what I've heard um, is that it's it's an aggregate. So it's it looks at, it, it learns how people write based on what it sees. So that's good. It means you you write based on what it's been learning from. So I think that's a good sign. <laughs> it, it was very interesting. It was very interesting to see that. I was like, wait a minute, I would have, and, and there are actually, once you become, a, a, you know, once you become really familiar with academic writing, you'll find that there's a formula to it. Wow. And, um, and, you know, you'll see when you're reading a lot of academic works, especially in your field, whatever field that you're studying, you'll see the same individuals there, you'll see the same, um, the same wording being used. And that's great, because that's, those are, that's the language that, that you want to be able to put in your own writing. Yeah. And there's definitely a cadence to it, you know, so when you, when you read, you'll, you know, sometimes I read papers from students and I'll say, you know, that there's a lot of abrupt stops because the, the sentence flow is too halting. Um, so yeah, I think that's good advice to read more uh, papers in your discipline because you start to get the, the formula. Um, we have another question from Leticia who says, I come from a family of immigrants. My partner is also a new immigrant from Colombia. Um, a big happy family of recent our area of Queens has have been getting a high influx of immigrants too. Um, what advice could you offer us to be helpful to our new locals and prevent culture shock, shock slash any difficulties of living amongst new environments? That is an excellent question, Leticia. Um, as the person who is there, you are kind of what they call that in terms of migration um, literature, they call that the host nation or the host community. And so I think when I look at it from that perspective, if you are living there in that area of Queens, which I grew up in Brooklyn, by the way, Brooklyn and Queens, so yay, yay Queens. Um, and you are the host. So these people are, you know, they're coming in, they have a variety of needs. You're not going to know those needs just by, you know, whatever you're seeing in the media. And so 
a lot of times the language is going to be difficult, but remember they have a language. They have a full language. It may not be English. So English is going to be a secondary language or third, maybe it's, maybe it's the fifth language, depending on where they're coming from, you know? So uh, we have to be mindful that they are full human beings that are coming and they're going to be confused you're not going to be able to prevent the culture shock that just is i mean i literally studied all this i worked with ell students for you know i don't know 7 8 years before i moved overseas and you know so you're thinking oh cognitively i knew exactly what i was getting into but the experience is not the same thing as what you imagine it to be so you know, kindness, I think, goes really far. Just, you know, if, if you see someone, you know, that, that they're struggling to, to, you know, to connect with someone or they're, if you're there in the store and, and they can't, they can't figure out what, you know, what the, what the dollars are, the cents are, whatever it is, if they need help, you know, figuring out how to run a credit card, whatever, uh, or a debit card, you know, just a little bit of kindness goes a long way, you know, and, um and, and, I think that that's really what people need when when they're in any community, just to have a sense of belonging and and a smile and a little bit of kindness. A good morning goes so far, really, because a lot of this is just it takes time, and um, anything that makes them feel like they belong in that space will, will is is probably more than what anybody expects. Great, right. thank you. A great question. Any other questions? I have a question. Um, uh, my question is really just about, you know, uh, re reflecting back on your time and you've, you know, shared all of your sort of um, educational paths and, and the winding trajectory that brought you to where you are now. What advice would you, you know, give students? Um, I know you had mentioned that you know, take opportunities. Um, are there other kind of tips that you would give students who are trying to figure out exactly where they want to land um, in psychology, some things that they can do or should do? Yeah, um, one, and this is uh, some things that I tell my students, um, you know, when, whenever I speak to them is those opportunities are not going to come your way. You have to go out and actually place yourself in, in positions where you meet people. So I know it's really hard to say networking, especially for people who are introverted. It's very difficult. I, I, am introverted. It doesn't look like that because I'm in, I, I do really well at being extroverted, but, um, but I am generally introverted and I had to learn that. And so volunteering, you know, going into, if, if that's a space that you want to work in, that you can imagine yourself working in a particular organization, you know, see if they will take you as a volunteer, see if they'll take you as an intern, see if, you know, just go in and start reaching out to people. LinkedIn is huge. Uh, you know, have your, make yourself a LinkedIn page. It doesn't have to be full of all of these, you know, great things that you've already done. Trust me, you have done a lot just through life and take those life experiences and, you know, and, and make them into a whole person that you are. Don't just say, oh, I just did that on the side on a Sunday afternoon, but you know, yeah, I coordinated this. Those are all important skills that go across industries. So you need to learn to market yourself and brand yourself. And I'm not good at this. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying things to you that I need to say to myself as well. My LinkedIn is totally out of, out of, uh, out of whack right now, but, um, you know, if you're if you're in that space where you really want to, where you're looking for where you want to go, you're looking for the pathway, uh, and you know what you like, or even if you don't know what you like, but you just like a lot of things, like I did. You know, I still do. You just put yourself in those spaces, and um, and people, if people keep seeing you, again, this is psychology, right? This is social psychology. If people keep seeing you, and and you're still, you're always there. You become familiar, and then you, and then they just you know, they assume you belong and they'll, and they'll, they'll find a place for you, but you have to be there. And, and those are both in, in person places and online spaces. And I think a lot of people are very good in online spaces, but we need to have a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. I want to, um, to, I'm going to bounce to Casey's question since it's related to what we we're just talking about. And then I'm going to go back to your question, um, Lee. So Casey's question is similar, you know, saying that, you know, um, she's working on an MA in psychology, doing the IO track and can relate to your interests in a lot of different areas. And was wondering if you had any advice about how to get more exposure um, to, to social and educational psychology. So specifically those two areas, um, yeah. where someone be at in order to be seen? 
Well, um, for social psychology, social psychology is everywhere. So mm -hmm. anywhere and everywhere that you are is social psychology. It's really about the frame, the mindset that you have and the conversations that you have. So uh, if you want to get into educational psychology, my First thing would be go volunteer at a local school. Um, you know, whatever your school is nearby, get yourself on the on the, on the list and start working with the educators. And they'll, you know, you'll you'll do things like uh, you know making copies or whatever. But the point is to get yourself in that space. And you know, again, there are ways in which people socialize in that space. So if you're interested in research about the way people socialize within an educational uh, discipline, that gives you a perfect place to, you know, to, to reflect on it. I think anything with social psychology really has to do with reading the theories of it and looking at your experiences and reflecting on those. I know it's it's going to sound like, oh, journaling. Oh, you want me to journal? Yeah, I do. I want you to journal because that's when, you know, some of those connections get made. And, um, you know, and any other, I guess when you think about social psychology, if it's not in an educational space, what other space of social psychology are you interested in? What organizations are you interested in? Are you interested in NGOs? Are you, which aspect of social psychology are you really interested in? And that's where you want to start, you know, volunteering. You want to start reaching out. You want to start making net, networking with those areas. So really, you need to you need to define those places that you see yourself working where you imagine yourself, because if you imagine it, then you can find connections to it. But you really have to kind of narrow down uh, where those spaces are for you. Education, go and just go to a high school. Go, they, they need you. Go to a, you know, go to anybody. They, they need you. We need you. <laughs> Great. Thank you. And Lee's question, I think, is one that a lot of people can relate to. Lee mm -hmm. says, I am also a mom. Um, how do you manage your time versus the guilt, if any, that you feel when dedicating your time to school? And I think this could probably, you know, go for fathers as well. Anyone who's really a caregiver, how do you kind of pull yourself away from that and allow yourself to have time for the 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 um, self care and the the advancement of yourself? You know, that, and that was so funny because I was thinking about that when I put my PowerPoint together. I was like, oh my god, it looks like I do nothing but work, um, but. But a lot of it is really just managing the work and I have uh, and, and making space for my family, my family, my, my kids are older, but they're still at home, which is lovely for me because I still get to have time with them. Uh, but, you know, we, we, we go places, we, we watch a lot of TV. That's why I know what Pedro Pascal is the most important man right now, because I watch all of those things on TV right now, because that's what they like, you know, so, um, and with my other son, he, the, you know, the kinds of work that he's doing, he's working in AI. And so, you know, he'll run ideas ideas by me. And, and so those are conversations that, you know, that I want to be there for. Um, but that's because of now I can kind of, you know, I live off of my calendar and everything is really put into my calendar. And sometimes, yeah, like sometimes I do have to say, you know, I got, I got to get to a meeting. Um, my son, just before this started, my son made me a, a, a like breakfast this morning. And I thought, and the first thing I thought was like, oh my God, I don't have time for breakfast. And, and then I was like, no, no, you know what? He's making me breakfast. <laughs> When is anybody going to make me breakfast? I am going to spend that 10 minutes and eat that bagel with, with you know, cheese and, and egg, which was really good that that he did. And, um, you know, and, and that even those 10 minutes, they, they make they make a difference. And I've had the guilt. I have the guilt. We all have the guilt. It's, uh, you know, it's always going to be there. I think it's just managing it um, the best way that you can and having as many good qualitative moments. Sometimes you can have a lot of quantitative, you know, a lot of time, but it's really not spent, you know, well, or you're arguing or this or that. So try to have quality time and, you know, breathe through it. When you feel that guilt, you know, you can always look at my PowerPoint and say she got it too. <laughs> not alone. And, you know, Lee, I think one of the other things I would add to to everything Dr. N said is that, you know, there's plenty of research that shows that being a better version of yourself and fulfilling yourself, making yourself happy, you know, fulfilling your dreams makes you a better parent, makes you a better partner. It makes you a better friend. Um, so I, I think you can use that as, as the sort of driving force and say, I'm, I'm actually doing this for my kids. I'm actually doing this for my partner. And, um, you know, because taking care of myself is taking care of them. You, you can't be there for them if, if you're not 
you're not happy and you're not fulfilled yourself. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. You could be there in, in physical, but not be there in, you know, in your, in your spirit or your mind. And so um, you really, you really have to balance that for ways that work for you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you, you, the, the guilt is going to come, it's going to nag because we're human beings. And, and, you know, if you're a mom or a dad, any caregiver that it's always going to be like, I should be doing this, I should be doing that. Oh, my God, the tyranny of the shoulds. That's Karen Horn. I, oh, my God, that was the, one of the best things I've ever learned was the tyranny of the shoulds. Those shoulds are going to pull you down. Mm-hmm. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Posh and Zadie, thank you for uh, participating today. Um, Thank you to all of you for joining and thank you for our events team for hosting um, and making sure things go off without a hitch as they often do. I wish you all the best for those of you who are in the tri-state area. I hope you're braving through this storm and enjoying the snow and hopefully we will see you again at another future event. Take care, everyone. Bye, everyone.